the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15, verses 15 onwards. You know, Lord, remember me and take care of me. Avenge me on my persecutors. Lord, you are slow to anger. Do not banish me. Know that for you I have borne insult. When I found your words, I devoured them. Your words were my joy, the happiness of my heart. Because I bear your name, Lord God of hosts, I did not sit celebrating in the circle of merrymakers. Under the weight of your own hand, I sat alone, because you filled me with wrath. Why is my pain continuous, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? To me, you are like a deceptive brew, waters that cannot be relied on. Thus the Lord answered me, If you come back and I take you back, in my presence you shall stand. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be my mouth. God our Father, we have come together as St. Paul's Bible College students and well-wishers to learn about the major prophets. As we are here on our monthly learning, Bless each of us present here. Bless all the newcomers that being inspired by the word of God, we may continue to minister to it in whatever capacity we are in. As we learn today, the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel may we be also turned to be prophets in our own ministry and life. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, good evening to you. Hearty welcome to this. Good evening, Father. How are you all? Fine, and thank evening, you. How are you, Father? Fine, Father. Fine, Father. Thank you. Very good. So today we have a lot of new faces, and uh, I'm happy that every month we are able to reach out to more students, and thanks to many farmers that who are joining from different places and even my own farm mates and fathers are here so thank you and the regional secretary is also there so thank you for your presence here and we get into the lecture and kindly mute your microphones so that we don't have any interruption in the lecture Let me share my screen with you. Good. I hope you are able to view my screen. Good. For this evening, our topic is Major Prophets. This is part of St. Paul's Bible College online lecture series ninth lecture so to situate this particular lecture in the context of our study for the newcomers the saint paul's bible college is an initiative of the ccbi commission for bible it has two platforms online and postal students are most welcome to join any one of these courses online and postal and at the end of 24 lessons we award a diploma this is actually, in fact, the second set of students we are working with. And from June, we have begun and we have come to the ninth lecture. Last month, we had our eighth lecture on minor prophets. Usually, this lecture is on the last Sunday of every month. But last month and this month, we have anticipated due to some other programs that are coincided. So with that, somebody has to... Yes. Good. So this being the ninth lecture, this is the outline of the lesson that we are going to have. As usual, we'll have the first hour that is about 40 to 50 minutes of exposure. 
then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes of interaction good now to the lecture the outline for this evening is classified into six number one profit what is the general understanding about the word profit about the prophetic office then number two classification like last month when we read about minor prophets we were trying to classify major and minor prophets and there are other classifications also possible we'll see that's number two number three we'll see prophet isaiah then four jeremiah then five ezekiel and six daniel as you see from the outline we have four major prophets they are isaiah jeremiah ezekiel daniel and if you remember the previous lecture we had 12 minor prophets and we get into number one the first title prophet who what and why so we are going to see now who is a prophet what is the meaning of the word prophet and why there was a need to have a prophet for example there are different people like judges were there we have samson gideon or we had kings like saul david solomon and we had priests like aaron levi and now what is this new office prophetic office and what was the function within the entire people of israel and what is the significance of today so this will be our first one minute somebody is again good so to begin with prophet it comes from the hebrew word nabi and it has an akkadian root which means foretelling we'll come to that shortly and when it comes to the greek equivalent we have two words prophetain and prophetess so prophetain is the verb prophetess is a noun and from this particular greek word we have the english equivalent prophet so prophet could be both male and female male we call them as prophets and female prophetesses and a, one example of a prophetess would be hulda or they say gulda so in this particular prophetess we have during the time of josiah in fact she interprets the scroll that was found in the temple so both male and female prophets and prophetesses had a key role in office and there was no gender discrimination as such when it comes to the prophetic office and what is the meaning of a prophet so prophet was doing two functions number one they were foretelling number two they were forth telling what is the meaning of foretelling foretelling means telling something about that which would happen in the near future or distant future so they are able to foretell or forecast or they are able to tell ahead ahead of time for example jeremiah jeremiah stands in front of the temple and jeremiah stands in front of the king and tells about the future babylonian captivity for example when he comes with a yoke so he comes with a yoke like a wedge used for connecting the bull with the bullock cart he comes and walks in front of the king so there in fact what is he trying to communicate he foretells like as this particular prophet jeremiah is carrying a yoke the people of israel will be let in bondage to babylon this was his message and this here we see jeremiah's foretelling what that would happen in the near future but there is also another kind of function they do that is called forth telling Fourth telling means I stand in front of somebody and I talk to that person. So it is to stand forth. For example, Nathan comes and stands in the presence of David and proclaims God's word. So what is the function of Nathan there? Nathan is not anyway foretelling like what would happen to David, but still there is an element of foretelling that because he tells that the Lord says that the sword will not leave your house. So again, it's a kind of foretelling, but more than foretelling, what is there is nathan is able to forth tell stand forth in front of david and talk to him and also they were able to talk in front of people as jeremiah does so both jeremiah also was foretelling and forth telling and nathan also was 
was more of a fourth telling person than a fourth telling person. So these are the two functions of a prophet, fourth telling and fourth telling. And the prophets were individuals, like we have Isaiah. Isaiah was an individual prophet. And there were also groups. For example, we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah was always accompanied by his secretary, Baruch. So from here only we get the Deuterocanonical book, Baruch. Baruch was in fact Jeremiah's secretary, which means it was a group of people who were doing prophetic work. So Baruch also, though was a secretary, he was also a kind of a prophet. So it's forming a group. Third one, school of prophets. School of prophet means different individuals, but reflecting the same idea. For example, we see shortly in the book of Isaiah, in the book of, I, I hope you are able to view my screen. Okay. Somebody started the process. Yes, somebody is also sharing the screen. One minute. Yes. Good. Very good. So the third one we are talking about is school of prophets where the people shared same ideology. For example, we'll see shortly the book of Isaiah. We have three sections there, proto, deutero, and trito. In fact, the first one is the real prophet Isaiah. The second and the third ones, they more or less share the same thinking pattern of the prophet Isaiah. So it's like a they come after prophet Isaiah and they're able to share the same thinking. That's why they called one school of prophets. So this, when we talk about Isaiah, he could be both an individual and also belonging to a school of prophets. Then the next one, they were both sent by God and they were self-proclaimed. For example, they were sent by God often, like Isaiah is sent forth, Isaiah is called, Jeremiah is called, Ezekiel is called. And but then there are some places where we don't have the call stories proper, but they go and proclaim that I am the I am the sent one of God, like Amos. When Amos goes there, and he was in fact sent out by the priests of Bethel because they thought like he's a self-proclaimed prophet. But later he makes them realize that he was sent by God. So the prophets are necessarily sent by God, and sometimes they can be self-proclaimed. But often what happens? Those who are sent by God are real prophets. The self-proclaimed ones are false prophets. Like in the case of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah foretells in front of King Zedekiah, there comes the prophet Hananiah. Hananiah is a false prophet. What is he talking? He in fact tells that Babylon will not capture Jerusalem and Jerusalem will remain forever. And in fact, what was the message behind is uh, Zedekiah, wanted to hear something very soothing, something beautiful. And Hananiah was trying to convey with a message which was politically correct. Rather, Jeremiah was against, he was trying to tell what was really going to happen. Hananiah was a kind of sugarcoating the message of God and he was a self-proclaimed prophet. And that's another group. Usually the self-proclaimed prophets like Hananiah are false prophets. And prophets also were judges, like we have in the case of Deborah, in the book of Judges, she was both a judge and also a prophetess because she was able to tell what would happen to the what would be to Sisera. Sisera is being chased by Barak, and Barak overtakes, and that way he was she was able to tell what is going to happen. So that way, prophetesses were both judges and prophetess. Now look at the last sentence. We have three offices: priestly office, kingly office, prophetic office. All along. When we look at the canonical development of the Bible, so here first we have in the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis we see Cain and Abel. The Cain and Abel in the narrative, Cain and Abel, they are the ones who first offer sacrifices to God. And later, Noah offered sacrifices. After that, what happens? Abraham offered sacrifices, Jacob offered sacrifices. So when we take the book of Genesis, what happens? In the pre mibel history, that is from chapters 1 to 11, who offered sacrifices? 
anybody can offer sacrifice so cain can offer abel can offer yeah, then noah can offer but after that after the primeval history that is from chapter genesis 12 from there it starts patriarchal history there what happens only the patriarch or the father of the family is able to offer and abraham was both a patriarch and a priest because he was able to offer sacrifices to god jacob he was also a patriarch and also he was able to offer sacrifices to god as a priest so here already the priestly office is developing not as an office but anybody who is able to offer sacrifices but even then we talk there already when it comes to abraham abraham the law the his, his, his cousin lot is being taken as a captive so what abraham does abraham gathers people fights with the enemies and relieves lot and comes on the way only he meets melchizedek so there what we see abraham was a patriarch he was a priest because he was offering sacrifices and he was also a kind of a king a tribal king he was able to take care of his own people and later when it comes to the the possession of the promised land sarah dies and abraham wants to get a piece of promised land and then what happens the people in the village come together and say you are a great person you are a owner of a lot of fields and cattle where you have to borrow our so where you have to buy a land from us everything is yours there already abraham is quoted as a kind of a king but later when it comes to the narrative of isaac uh being uh sorry, sorry, the before that yeah that isaac narrative also comes in gerar abraham goes with sarah and sarah is being taken by the local king there abraham comes across as a prophet so abraham was the first one to be called as a prophet in the bible so when you take the character of abraham he was a patriarch he was a priest he was a king and he was a priest uh, sorry prophet and all these three offices were held by him but later maybe after the exodus in the exodus what happened uh, moses goes to the the egyptian bondage and he releases people out of bondage and he takes people to the promised land on the way that we see in the book of leviticus a priestly office develops under the leadership of his own brother aaron there you look at these two persons moses is more of a king like who was managing people who was managing day-to-day -day affairs and aaron was more of a priest who was offering sacrifices so in mosaic times already these two offices kingly office but not as a king proper but as an administrator as a steward develops then aaron also is a priest now two offices there and but there is no prophet but in the book of deuteronomy we have a verse where it says i will raise a prophet like moses which means what is the implication moses was not only a king a kind of administrator but he was also a prophet so in the book of deuteronomy till deuteronomy or we can say in the entire pentateuch these three offices are intermingled a prophetic office kingly office and priestly office but later only that is after people get settled in the promised land then there was joshua after joshua there were judges then comes samuel samuel was the last judge and the first prophet prophet as an office so the prophetic office even though it was administered as a like, informal way as a real formal office begins with samuel and the kingly office begins with saul priestly office in fact begins with all the descendants of aaron and now during the time of the monarchical period or the pre-exilic period, post-exilic period, these three offices were very firm and they had their own functions and they were competing with each other to tell who is greater. Especially we see in the case of Solomon. Now uh, David is about to die and uh, Solomon has to take over. Who's like the first uh, son of david adonijah and this one abiyatar abiyatar supports solomon so now again nathan comes nathan comes in support of again nathan comes to support Bathsheba. Bathsheba through Bathsheba wants to come wants to support solomon now look at these three persons here solomon is a king uh, nathan is a prophet abiyatar is a priest so already three persons are mutually like they are in a way influencing each other 
and this mutual influence was very high during the time of the monarchical period now these three words we take and apply to the person of jesus and later to the servant ministerial priesthood so according to the canon law the three mooner as i say like uh, every priest functions in three ways he is a priest because he offers sacrifices he is a king because he administers the parish and he is a prophet because he proclaims the good news of god and these three offices are in fact taken from the person of jesus jesus was a priest like a high priest as the letter to the hebrews beautifully tells because he was a compassionate high priest compassionate to the human persons and faithful to god and he was a king king in the sense even with the with the encounter with the pilot we have are you the king of jews so jesus was a king and jesus was considered as a prophet so when jesus was healing many people people were in fact telling a great prophet has arisen among us so from jesus we take and we apply to a priestly uh, a priest that is a ministerial priesthood takes these three offices so once it begins as informal roles in the patriarchal time later monarchical period they become formal offices and these formal offices are attributed to jesus and from jesus we take and even anyone it's not necessarily ministerial priesthood especially when we talk about the synod for a synodal church now all the people of god are all partaking in this threefold office of jesus priestly office because we offer prayers intercessions a kind of a sacrifice we are administrators of a parish through different participatory structures and we are also prophets in the sense we are proclaiming good news so that way each one of us is a is a is a prophet each one of the baptized person is a prophet according to the present understanding so this is the first one to understand about the word now we go to the second one classification or types how do we classify the prophets this may be a repetition to the persons who attended last week last last month first one first classification is literary and non literary so literary prophets non literary prophets literary prophets are those who have books in their names for example isaiah isaiah has a book in his name literary jeremiah has a book in his name literary daniel has a book in his name literary but coming to non literary let's take for example nathan nathan is a non literary prophet because there is no book called nathan elijah is a non literary prophet because there is no book called elijah elisha is a non literary prophet because there is no book called elisha so if they have a book in their name they are literary prophets if they don't have book they are non literary prophets that's number one number two classification is classical prophets non classical prophets so like more or less they are like they are equivalent literary and non literary they are synonymous with classical and non classical classical means like they have real literature in their name so when it comes to classical all even the minor prophets major prophets all could be classical prophets for example hosea classical prophet but nathan is a non classical prophet because he is not holding any book in his names like both are synonymous coming to the third classification the prophets are divided based on the timeline so that the center point of division is 587 when people of israel were taken in exile the second exile that is babylonian exile so they are based on that particular exile they say three groups pre exilic exilic post exilic in the sense the prophets who existed before babylonian exile then the prophets who existed during the babylonian exile third one the prophets who existed after that exile so when it comes to these three it not only refers to the time but also refers to the message so the message is usually the pre exilic prophets they have a message of doom a message of desolation message of sorrow because something bad is going to come so they will be always talking about the doom that was going to happen exilic prophet they were more offering comfort because already people are suffering and there is no real hope what they needed is only comfort and consolation so in the exilic prophets we have a more message of consolation in the post exilic prophet there is a kind of a more message about restoration hope that things would be better 
So these three are not only according to the timeline, but also according to the theme. Pre-exilic is a kind of a doom, message of doom, exilic message of comfort, post-exilic message of hope and restoration. And from there we get two types again, prophets of doom, prophets of hope. So the prophets would talk about the bad things that would happen are prophets of doom and prophets of hope are that they give consolation. But some prophets have both. For example, we have prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah on the one hand talks about Babylonian captivity. So he's a prophet of doom. However, he also talks about the new covenant when things will be restored. So he's a prophet of hope. Coming to Isaiah, Isaiah in a way talks about the Assyrian exile. But however, he talks about the Emmanuel message, God is with us. So he also offers hope. So some prophets are both prophets of doom. Means we can say some texts are doom texts, some texts are hope texts. This is how we can classify. And another classification is, as I said earlier, true prophets and false prophets. True prophet example could be Jeremiah and false prophet example could be Hananiah. And when it comes to Jesus' time in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus again warns about false prophets. And in Jesus' time also, this is not existed as, a, as an office, but people who were false prophets were like, a, as far as the Sermon on the Mount is concerned, those who are just verbose with their words and they are not able to pull, put them in the action, they are in fact false prophets. Jesus wants, in fact, his own disciples not to be a false prophet and to be aware of false prophets. And the last classification is minor prophet and major prophet. And we said in the last lecture, minor refers to not the character like somebody is major somebody is minor no it refers to the book so the book which has small numbers or small chapter little uh, less chapters are less text they are called the minor prophets and the prophets those who have literary composition which is relatively larger than the minor prophets are called major prophets so we don't treat or uh, we don't put them on a scale so somebody is major somebody is minor but it's all because of the literary composition. So when we talk about major prophets and minor prophets, this particular classification is possible because of the literary composition. Good. That concludes now the first and second part. So to quickly review, in the first part we said, what is the meaning of prophet? Why was there a prophetic office? And how the prophets were functioning? And in the second one, we classified it. Classical, non-classical, literary, non-literary, major, minor, true, false. Because these words will come across in different commentaries. So just when we talk about prophet of doom, so what does it refer to? Doom means a message of discomfort or a message of sorrow, a message of destruction. This is how we are able to understand. So having set the background, now we get into the first major prophet, who is none other than Isaiah. And some key themes that we have in Isaiah are, number one, unclean lips. So this, when we talk about Isaiah, first thing we have to come out is his own call, where he tells in front of God that his lips are unclean. That's why a charcoal comes in the presence of God and it wipes away his lips, which means he's going to be a mouthpiece of God. So that's a major theme. Then we have the theme of Emmanuel, God with us. It was given to King Ahaz. Then suffering servant, which we will be reading shortly during the time of Lent, especially in the Holy Week, the suffering servant. Then inscription in the palm of God's hand. So a very beautiful metaphor. Isaiah is full of metaphor, like a, a God is referred to as a mother who is nursing a child. And God tells that I will not forget you. And I have inscribed you in my, in my palms. It's kind of a, a real revolution because I, one way it's an anthropom anthropomorphic vocabulary but on the other hand suppose you inscribe on a, on your palms you will never forget because you are in touch with your palm, palms always when you eat when you write so something you will never forget so that's the meaning of inscription in the palm of god's hand we'll be seeing these themes shortly so now we get into the prophet isaiah to begin with in the book of isaiah we have 66 chapters these 66 chapters could be divided into three sections. First Isaiah, second Isaiah, third Isaiah, or we can say with a little uh, Latinized form, Proto-Isaiah, Deutero-Isaiah, Trito-Isaiah. So in English text you will see first, but in some commentaries you will see Proto. Chapters 1 to 39, they belong to first Isaiah. 
40 to 55, second Isaiah, 56 to 66, third Isaiah. And look where this, uh, this was written and when this was written. The first Isaiah, they say, against the hypothesis, there is no uh, proven information that this was written, but more or less from the point of view of grammar and the manuscript, syntax, the Hebrew language we are able to identify to which age this particular text belongs. Seventh century must have been written in Jerusalem because mostly the most of the themes are surrounded about Jerusalem. Then second Isaiah, fifth century BCE, Babylonia. Third Isaiah, fifth century Judea. And Judea, again, they are kind of restoration. So if you look at the message here, Isaiah that first to 39 will be like, a, as I said earlier, prophet or prophecy of doom, discomfort will be there. For guess different problems are there. For example, Yehaz, Emmanuel sign is there. Some problem with the, the king and he's trying to give a give a desolation and he's really confused and God is coming with a, with a, with a sign that is the virgin will conceive. Then in the Babylonia, here we have we'll have we'll have this particular reading in the holy week on the palm sunday and on the good friday where it talks about the people who are suffering suffering servant in babylon which means they are in exile they are in babylonian captivity they are struggling they are suffering and how that particular suffering comes out that's what expressed in the second isaiah third one is like a more consolation like we have a text for epiphany like you will be carried away by in your own arms and you will never be dragged so this particular like arise shine so all these messages of uh, restoration are found in the third isaiah this is just to give an overview of the, the prophet isaiah now we get into some details number one what is the meaning of the word isaiah isaiah means yahweh saves so isaiah or yahweh is salvation he was son of amos nothing to do with our prophet amos he is different Amos. Then call in the temple of Jerusalem. So as soon as you think about Isaiah, you think about the temple. Isaiah receives the call when he was in the temple. And the temple, there is glory of God. Glory of God, in front of the glory of God, Isaiah feels his own unworthiness. As we heard in the first reading, like if we had today the readings for Blessed Kuriakos Chavara, we had the reading from 2 Corinthians where Paul tells the treasure in clay parts, like a clay parts, like an unclean thing. But in that, God has put the treasure, which is his ministry. And more or less, Isaiah, we, he feel like though he was an unworthy person living among the unworthy people with unclean lips, God has called him. That's the call story, very beautiful story. And what is the implication here? The implication is, he lives amidst the people of uncleanliness, which means there was political perversion, religious perversion, and God called him to be a counter witness. So as we said earlier, in every call narrative, there is a problem and somebody comes to solve the problem. And look at the call story here. First, God calls somebody, which means initiative is always from God. So a prophet receives a prophetic call not on account of his merit, not account of his volunteering, but not account of his own self-projection, but always because of God's initiative. That's the number one. Then number two, when the particular person is called, he hesitates. Like Isaiah tells, I am unclean, I have unclean lips. Jeremiah tells, I am only a boy. And Moses tells, I am a stammerer. So these are different. They, they try to hesitate because they're really not sure about what would happen. That's the second one. Third one, God gives an assurance or a sign. So here he, he is giving a sign that charcoal, fire star charcoal is a sign. Then fourth one, God tells the prophet or God tells the person that I will be with you. The kind of um, accompaniment is promised. Then finally, the prophet, the one who is called, accepts the call. So these five elements are present in the call story of Isaiah and in the call story of Jeremiah. And this call story happens in the temple of Jerusalem. Then we go to the next one. He was a prophet during the time of Yehaz. Yehaz in English, Ahaz in Hebrew. Suppose you say Ahaz was a person who was ruling Judah. And now we need to understand what is Judah. Judah is not only a tribe, but Judah also is a country. What is the country? How does it refer to? After Solomon, the kingdom of that the United Kingdom, which David built, divides into two, southern and northern. 
northern kingdom is called israel southern is southern kingdom is called judah and there were some southern kings ahas was a southern king so when we talk about ahas the sign of emmanuel is given to a southern king judah so we need to just situate where ahas is ahas is not in northern israel but southern judah however he had his judah was at the bottom and there were assyrians on the top egyptian at the bottom they were already they were disturbing judah because to go from assyria to egypt they had to pass through judah and judah also suffered a lot because of this foreign country especially the superpowers assyria hittites babylonians and egyptians and that is the background to agas so for the timing let's understand isaiah prophesied during the time of agas then coming to judah and israel division just i explained then what is syro ephraimite war here syro referred to syria not the modern syria but assyria so assyria is called syria syro ephraimite what is ephraim ephraim is a one of the tribe which was living in judah so the judah is called also ephraim tribe so syro ephraimite war so what is the context now assyria was there egypt was there and now the people of judah i uh, was the uh, egypt was telling to counter assyria you join with us because if you join with us we can fight together but what god said to you earlier never ever go to egypt because you were one slaves there but now ahas is confused whether to go to um, egypt or to join with assyria or how he is going to fight so there the message is given so the message of immanuel comes during the time of syro ephraimite war and isaiah was prophesying especially during this type, type of war then when isaiah was prophesying these perversions were happening religious perversion political perversion so what is the religious perversion religious perversion has to do with the temple temple was primarily for god lord of israel that is yahweh but as kings developed for example solomon brought many foreign wives those foreign wives brought their own gods and goddesses they were put in the temple so foreign gods were worshiped in the lord's temple and that led to religious perversion not only that worship in the temple they were also influenced by other cults for example canaanite religion fertility cult it had a lot of impact on them then child offering or child sacrifice and that was a very cruel thing that they will offer a child to god a child sacrifice many kings were many king manasseh was leading people into child sacrifice even ahas had that tendency so these are all religious perversion political perversion because people were trying to join even the enemy forces and one nation was trying to trying to encounter and try to fight with the other even there was a fight between israel and judah even though they belong to one group after the division they were starting fighting this was a political perversion amidst this particular context isaiah prophesies so isaiah call comes and where we see glory and holiness of god so god is a person who is glorious and he is holy then we have the next one emmanuel prophecy which we explain the context just now there he tells behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a child so here we have a little confusion here some people ask for example some protestants will ask us in the sense they say uh, we say this particular verse refers to mary and mary's virginal conception refers to jesus because jesus is immanuel according to the gospel of matthew so now how do we answer or how do they pose this question the question is very simple the word that is used here is alma alma in hebrew is meaning it means young woman young woman does not mean a virgin woman but for a virgin the word that is to be used is betula but when this was translated into greek septuagint what was rendered was parthenon parthenos which is a virgin to do with chastity so from there only we get the word virgin and since our bible that is especially the liturgical bible follows the septuagint and the vulgate the jerome's vulgate translation and it was jerome who rendered this as a, as virgin and from there only we get the christian reading or a catholic reading it refers to mary so actually the young woman so young woman means a married woman it refers to somebody who is in who is in ahas con ahas his own 
his own maybe harem is part of his own wives and one of the wives will conceive and bear a child son so immediately it refers to one of the kings but later Ezekiah but later only it refers to the virginal conception that is referred to Messiah so now we need to understand in Hebrew what we have is young woman but in Greek and later in Latin and later now in Catholicism we have the word virgin and a virgin has to do with the virginal conception but young woman has no connotation as a just to, to clarify why some people have this particular problem but we as Catholics we believe that this is a virgin conceived of that Jesus is the Emmanuel conceived of virgin mother Mary good then the next one next book is called second book of comfort like the second book is full with the message of comfort Yahweh is the holy one of Israel then coming to the second one where we have four poetry or four poems where we have four suffering servants the last poem is very worth noting 52 13 to 53 12. so this particular suffering servant like in a way today we talk about dalit reading or feminist reading or subaltern reading like these are all when we many take this particular so here if you look at the text we have this particular reading on the good friday that he undergoes humiliation that servant undergoes humiliation he is rejected totally and he becomes a piece of mockery but he never says a word he not even utters one word and often the scholars say that silence is a retaliation so it's not like a, i i shout back or i fight back no it's a silence is the greatest type of retaliation according to the suffering servant poetry and this particular suffering servant like they have been trying to ask who is the referral point is it prophet isaiah or is it a messiah uh, they say more or less the people of israel they were in babylon as captives as bond a servant they were there everything they underwent humiliation but they couldn't talk anything but their silence was a kind of a mockery a silence was a kind of a kind of giving back retaliation so that's the beauty of servant psalm and we don't say that his, his silence was passive silence. Silence was very active silence. He chooses to be active so that he does not respond in a reactive manner. That's the beauty of this fourth suffering servant. So when we have time, we can read this particular suffering servant. And I always have to advise my students that we read Bible in our own vocabulary. That's in our own vernacular language, not in English. English, maybe if it is English is a spoken language or a mother tongue, it's good. Otherwise, if we read in our own mother tongue, it touches us all the more. So we, then we are able to feel with the text, especially the suffering servant. Then the third book, it talks about cultic renewal, how the entire cult of uh, idolatry will be removed and the true Yahweh worship will come. That is about Isaiah. So when you talk about Isaiah, just remember those themes and just remember the political and religious context. Now we have, yes, good. We go to Jeremiah, number four. When we talk about Jeremiah, some words to remember. A child, when he was called, he said he was only a child. And we have a beautiful poem where he says, Jeremiah says that you have deceived me and I am deceived. So he talks to God, one of the lamentations. Then he says, as we heard in the beginning text, I sat alone, like nobody was with me because I bore your word. And since your word was burning within me, I was a loner and I couldn't sit in a company of merrymakers because the word of God was burning within me and it was creating a wrath within me and I couldn't be at home with myself. That's a, it's a sad story of I sat alone. But Jeremiah is in fact given a very beautiful consolation. Then he talks about new covenant. This is some to idea about Jeremiah. Good. Jeremiah means Yahweh is exalted. He was 40 years a prophet. He was prophesying in Judah, especially in Jerusalem. He prophesied about Babylonian captivity. And when we talk about call of Jeremiah, like we have our sisters here, oftentimes for our first profession, final profession, silver jubilees, we take this particular call of Jeremiah because he tells, I consecrated you when you were in your mother's womb. Consecrated, which means I set you apart, which means you are not for this, but you are for something else. So that's the set, setting apart. And that's the, the call of God is not only like a 
call I mean, like when we talk about priests and religious call is not like a historical thing like it came through a vocation promoter or a superior no god has a plan that's a kind which means what is the what's the, the implication behind this we have a purpose in god's entire creation so our birth is not a like, historical accident Every, everybody has a purpose within that is a consecration and everybody is consecrated not only the priests and religious so each of us has a purpose and when we identify that purpose in fact we are able to get into that consecrated aspect of god that's the message of call of jeremiah then i get political religious condition more or less a condition of the people or the context of isaiah political perversion and religious perversion political perversion because of kings and religious perversion because of the temple and jeremiah primarily calls people to conversion if you don't convert you will be let into exile but people turn a deaf ear to him and the the end is very tragic and they are let into the babylonian captivity and he has some symbolic acts symbolic acts in the sense linen loin cloth so god tells you buy a new linen loin cloth you wear it for a while then you go and bury it under a the river so river bed so you will go after some months then he goes there and finds that almost torn into pieces so what is the meaning israel was a beautiful cloth in the in the in the, in the vesting of god but because of sin it's going to be like a dismantle or made to be powdered so that was the message given through linen loin cloth then smashing the pot so he smashes the pot which means the covenant that is between you and the people of israel is broken like the pot so the like symbolic acts and as i said earlier the yoke so he comes with a wooden yoke then he comes with a bronze yoke so that nobody can break it so these are some symbolic acts because the people of time were illiterate and god had to communicate through some metaphors so see, these are some metaphors then we have four confessions of jeremiah like we have confessions of saint augustine where he just talks to god his own self jeremiah also in fact jeremiah they say he suffered more than jesus like jesus suffering was like a, uh, even though there were a kind of uh, rejection all along but jesus suffered just uh, maybe one day or uh, one and a half days but jeremiah suffering was all 40 years so many times he wanted to give up because people his own people because he was talking he was the son of a priest from jerusalem and he was talking to the people of jerusalem his own people couldn't accept him more or like more or less like jesus his own people couldn't accept him but he was like in different places he was rejected and that is the word suffering and when we read his confessions we can see confessions of jeremiah how he was deeply wounded so in our own priestly religious life also like the text which we had in jeremiah 15 it talks about how i feel lonely like when you make a choice you have to become lonely for example superior is there and the community members are there superior has to make a choice so she makes a choice necessarily the choice divides the community because the community members don't want that choice so usually that superior becomes a loner so that's the message of jeremiah jeremiah had to make a choice to be with god and he makes a choice he becomes a loner suppose i am a parish priest and i have to make a decision and i see this is good for my people but people see things differently but i say i this decision is good and i take the decision people reject me i become a loner and i take the decision to the bishop or the local ordinary they also disown me so naturally i become a loner so in each of us at different moments we have this particular jeremiah who is become a loner person or a person who is rejected but however he tells Uh, you are deceived me and i have been deceived but somehow i want to stop this word being proclaimed but it's like in my bone marrow which means in the in the very essence of my body it is there burning so that's the type of uh, uh, experience jeremiah has one way he wants to give up the job but on the other hand he takes it as a very possessed shop possessed kind of a job where he, he enjoys being a prophet and confessions of jeremiah in fact portray us how we can person of prayer then the next beautiful thing he talks about new covenant is being replaced with the new covenant which is not written on stone but written on the heart so that you will have your own 
freedom and you can see and obey that's a beautiful message of jeremiah then we have jeremiah in prison jeremiah is thrown into prison because people were against his message and he was not able to say politically correct things we go to the next prophet ezekiel when it comes to ezekiel some things which we have heard of are already valley of dry bones god as shepherd glory of god like glory of god leaves jerusalem then individual and the corporate responsibility of each person and collectively of the society yes somebody has unmuted good we go to ezekiel i hope you are able to view yes ezekiel means god strengthens he was the son of a priest from 587 so 587 bc when the babylonian captivity happened and two deportations like it occurred in two stages 598 some groups were deported and 587 the major groups were deported or exiled and destruction of jerusalem and jerusalem temple so both are destroyed coming to ezekiel ezekiel is known for visions so different visions are there the first vision is a heavenly throne so heavenly throne like he like more or less that of isaiah isaiah sees the throne of god that is in jerusalem temple but here in fact he goes to a heavenly throne but now the question comes to us like where this particular concept of heaven angels or uh, angelic beings all these images come from they in fact come from persian literature or persian religion when the people were in babylonia so they were influenced from Persia, persian like cyrus the great already babylonians were dethroned by uh, cyrus the great who was a persian and because of them only they get all these concepts so which means uh, ezekiel is already influenced by this uh, concept of the persian literature or persian liturgy we can say this is the first vision second one valley of dry bones so valley of dry bones in fact it refers to the people of israel who in exile like a valley of dry bones like they were they didn't have any life only when god breathed life into them they received life and this breathing of god it again takes them back to the first creation sorry second creation story where god makes a man out of mud and he breathes into his nostrils that's the valley of dry bones up to the creation account that again creation story then we have shepherds and flock of israel like here in a way he talks about how kings fail to be true shepherds and god had to become a true shepherd of israel then in 36 we have a new heart and a new spirit like god promises that he would give a new heart then finally in 47 we have a beautiful metaphor of jerusalem temple being watered which means in the palestinian time being in water was a kind of a encouragement because they were scorching sun scorching heat and in that water becomes a symbolic element this particular vision is again it influences apocalyptic literature the book of revelation so these are the some things that we have heard so here the last one let's take the restoration of the temple 47 where the temple becomes a life-giving element so here written god gives restore god restores life to the people in temple now here look at the word here restoration of the temple so what is the meaning of restoration restoration simply means god's glory re-enters into jerusalem in the ancient near east or far as it is uh, asia uh, so western asia then what happens according to that literature when god leaves a particular sorry when people when people leave a particular place their god also leaves so that was the that was the, their belief and here in ezekiel we see glory of god leaves the temple as soon as people are deported to babylonia and god also travels with them so that is the and god travels with them means there is no god in the temple and there is emptiness now god returns more or less this particular image we have in the book of revelation where 
the lamb becomes a light to jerusalem new jerusalem comes new heaven and new earth so more or less ezekiel influences a lot of apocalyptic elements in the book of revelation we go to the last prophet last major prophet daniel daniel when we talk about daniel it immediately talks about his visions intelligence god's protection of the suffering and three friends that we have in our own divine office often it comes to the song of the three friends and daniel also we have some greek text in the deuterocanonical like susanna susanna story is a daniel story but it's a greek story i'll explain to you shortly the meaning of daniel yell means god dan means judge so god judges so there has two parts narrative part and apocalyptic part chapters 1 to 3 are narrative chapters 4 to 12 are apocalyptic narrative means like it tells a story what happened today what happened next day like this narration apocalyptic like more or like a visions what would happen in the future or what would happen in a future in a symbolic way and only the book of daniel has three languages altogether some parts are written in hebrew some parts are written in aramaic and some parts are written in greek like susanna story we have in greek the song we have in hebrew and nebuchadnezzar and daniel their dialogue they are in aramaic so which means the the author wanted to take the real language and put as it is then we have a concept called writing on the wall so king nebuchadnezzar is there so this story happened during the time of king nebuchadnezzar who is a babylonian king he only initiated that babylonian captivity and there one day he takes all the vessels from the temple and he uses the vessels of the temple which means vessels were reserved for god he uses them as a desecration for offering it to their own gods and also to drink wine so that becomes a desecration and that time we have a hand appearing and writing on the wall so the writing on the wall is an english idiom which means that something which is a warning it's like a warning is given this particular expression comes from daniel's story and here in fact we talk about a wisdom of a young person and look at the story here daniel's story happens where in nebuchadnezzar port it's a persia like more or less the persians already come in babylonia persia there and nebuchadnezzar is a foreign king daniel is a jew so a jewish person entering into a foreign court why this person has intelligence which is superior to all so more or less like uh, when we read about daniel our mind goes back to joseph's story joseph as a jew goes into a foreign place egypt and there he becomes a highly intelligent person he becomes a governor more or less both story daniel's story joseph's story they go like daniel also was misunderstood joseph was also misunderstood daniel becomes somebody who would advise the king Joseph also became a governor of Egypt. So this is uh, the parallel story. So what is the literary device? Literary device means the people of Israel wanted to tell each other, like it is not the circumstance that defines us. Like you may be a victim or you may be a prisoner in a foreign place. However, if God's hand is with you, you can be an intelligent person. That's a one, like a kind of a hope they are giving to their own people. Number two, we can say, it's a kind of a wisdom literature. Wisdom literature already wisdom influences. What is the influence? If you choose life, you will live. If you choose death, you will die. So in each moment, Daniel was choosing life. For example, instead of taking the side of our worshipping or offering incense to the, to the king. So he refrains from that. So he chooses life and he continues to be a living person. So that way wisdom influence also is there in the book of Daniel. Then Daniel has visions, four bees, and again, it influences apocalyptic literature. Then he has a son of man. This particular word expression, son of man, is taken from Daniel. Jesus often takes his expression and refers to himself, especially when it comes to passion predictions. So this is how Daniel is related to Jesus as well. So now we have concluded fifth five parts. Number one, we gave a basic background. Number two, that's a prophet. Then we classified the prophets. Then we went on to see Isaiah, then Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Now we'll put all these prophets together and we'll try to see what is their message for us today. Number one, Isaiah. Isaiah tells us God is our creator. 
which means God takes control of everything. So it's not us that we control things, but it's God. Number two, restoration of the city and people. God always restores the city. Like city suffered, people were let out of the city as slaves, but now they'll be brought back to the city. So people will be restored. Then God as a Lord, as King and Holy One of Israel. So he is the king because other kings were leading people into perversions. And he is the Holy One of Israel. And again, Isaiah talks about future Messiah. He is a kingly Messiah and a beautiful suffering servant, which often we refer to Jesus. Even though it refers to the people of Israel, but now in a Christian reading or Christological reading, canonical reading, we say it is its a referent point is Jesus Christ and we have the passion. And in the suffering servant, each of us can find our own presence there because at different moments, we also have been suffering servants. Coming to Jeremiah, the message is simple. God accompanies the called one. So God tells, they will be against you. But if you return to me, I will take hold of you. And even though they are against you, they will never win over. That's God's accompaniment. Like things may go wrong around us or people may turn against us. But the message is very simple. We will never be defeated. We will be invincible. So we'll be, we'll never be destroyed. That's the message of Jeremiah. And life has both consolation, desolation. Like Jeremiah also undergoes certain moments consolation, certain moments desolation. This particular word, two words, which we have in Ignatian rhetoric, when we make the one month rhetoric, they use these two words. Like when our spirit was consoled or when our spirit was in a low mode, desolation mode, consolation mode, desolation mode. And Jeremiah is the prophet like Moses, according to the First Testament. And Jesus is the initiator of the new covenant, especially in the, in the inauguration or in the installation of the Eucharist. He uses this particular word, new covenant, the blood of the new covenant. So that way, there is a connection between Jeremiah and Jesus. Coming to Ezekiel, we all need a new heart, new heart which is converted, which goes towards God. And God also works out his own spring of life around us and ultimately it is glory of god that has to be within us like we have in samson's story the spirit of the lord leaves samson and the saul from saul the spirit leaves but they were not aware of it even god left jerusalem people were not aware. but once he restored once he came back everything was restored last one daniel power of wisdom and power of prayer so wisdom means we choose always light so in like there is nothing predestined, like I will be like this, I'll be that. No, it's not a predestination, but it's a choice. We have a choice in our own life and we need to choose wisely. Then the last message of Daniel is prayer always wins. So Daniel wins on account of his prayer. So these are some messages we can take from these four major prophets. And coming to the final part, the assessment to those who are attending this course as a online or a postal, so the first question that we have two parts the first one is choose the best answer the second part is a descriptive answer so the first one isaiah jeremiah ezekiel are called major prophets because their written prophecies are more so what we have in red is the answer in two we have isaiah 1 to 13 chapters are written by isaiah of jerusalem third one the zero ephraimite war is a war between judah syria and israel Holy coalition. Number four, the only alien king called as God's anointed was Cyrus, because Cyrus was a Persian king. He releases people from the bondage of Babylon. Then number five, second exodus took place from Babylon to Judah. The first exodus was Egypt to the promised land. The second one is Babylon to Judah. They are returning. Number six, many scholars identify the suffering servant as the people of Israel who went about for three years in the streets of Jerusalem naked is Isaiah. The idea of bodily resurrection came to be explained in the Bible in Daniel. Daniel only we have moral because the Persian influence is there and the bodily res resurrection, like uh, resurrection of the body, which we talked about in Christian Catholic faith is influenced from Daniel. Number nine, the presence of Yahweh left the temple because alien gods were worshipped there. And number 10, last one, Ezekiel means God strengthens. Good. That concludes our lesson.
So to put together things very quickly, So we began with the, the outline. The outline had six parts, the meaning of prophet. Then we went to classification. Then the third one, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. We concluded with theological significance of these four books. Good. So I stop here. If you have any doubt, you could ask. And even you could use the chat box to write your own comments or questions. Or you could raise your hands. Candidate Joseph has raised. Anyone from the students, Holy Cross, Mysore? Father, I have a one small comment. One small. Ah uh, yes, sir. Ah uh, yes, sir. See this uh, three menorah. That is the offices. Three offices of uh, priest, mm -hmm. uh, prophet, and uh, king of Jesus. Because Jesus is called Jesus Christ. Christ means anointed one. So these three offices also is uh, related to the anointment and the uh, first testament, isn't it? Uh, Anointing of the priest, anointing of the prophet, and anointing of the king. So, similarly, and because Jesus Christ's name is Jesus Christ, the anointed one, so he is having all the three offices. And from him, we are getting the uh, duty, three duties of these offices. Very good, sir. So, that uh, that word Christ, like you are uh, giving a theological interpretation, I was trying to present it from gospel perspectives, like how Jesus was priest, or gospels and other writings, like letter to the Hebrews. But as you said, the word anointing. But uh, it has a little, uh, means uh, some who were anointed, kings were anointed, we are sure. Priests were anointed, we are sure. But whether prophets were anointed, that little, at least there because there is no for example samuel samuel was not anointed like anointing by anointing means the pouring of oil so uh, even in that case also like uh, who was poured oil that person was considered great like king was considered and priests they were they, their hands were they were they were not anointed but they were ordained different method was there like in the book of judges we have their hands will be filled so like different types of farms were there so one way we could say, but it has its own problem when it comes to uh, prophetic office. Good, yeah. sir. But I appreciate that that yeah. point, Christ. Very good. Yeah. Good. Father, yes, have, yes. Why God called only these prophets? Father, they would be holier than these prophets. Uh, okay, so why God called these prophets? Very good. So the second part, holier than? Holier than these prophets. Hmm. Would have been here, no? Yeah, sure. People would have been there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How do we answer? You yourself try to answer. Surely. So one answer could be like, God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. So this is the usual explanation. But still, like what you say is correct, like why God has to choose only these people. Maybe we can say God's ways were this way. So this is how I'm able to, but I, I don't know answer. Maybe I'll think over and the second part surely there are holier people there are more qualified people there are worthier people but still god's ways are god's ways this is how we can understand maybe others could help maybe for michael <laughs> joe oh no who knows she may be called to play the role of a prophet in your community yeah. or in the church <laughs> good so that way yes so, so we also have a role it means not necessarily Ah, very good, sir. Thank you, Father Joe. Like uh, the prophetic call is not restricted to that particular time or particular space. Like it extends beyond. 
so that way we also become prophets and you prophetesses very good each of us are having uh, god's plan is, god's plan is uh, he god is having a plan for each one of us as yes. uh, even in uh, jeremiah 29 11 his plans are for our own good so he chooses so yes, he sir. chooses we 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 don't choose, choose anything okay he chooses us so god takes us as the particular plan very good sir so, so we have to be humble and we should accept that plan and that is what we are supposed to do good thank you thank you mr terence thank you thank you for michael joe <laughs> yeah. thank you uh for the father I... father jesu you can also share how yes. the present pope francis is playing a prophetic role in today's world you know yes father sure especially when the net for a civil church is prophetic call in fact. Yes. yeah thank you Yes. Anyone else? We have Rose Terrace. Raised hand. Is it by hand or by choice? Alicia? Um, yeah. Hello, Father. I have a question regarding yes. Prophet Ezekiel. Uh, when didn't you mention about a new heart? So is there a connection with the word Greek word metanoia? Ah, okay. So here. Uh, when it comes to metanoia, it's a change of heart. So something more to do with the external things. But here it's more of an internal conversion. So here again, Ezekiel in a way always refers back to the creation story. So the first flesh was being put like a, uh, Adam is there. Adam's rib is removed and a woman is created. So God puts flesh. So that a kind of restoration, like God makes that person complete. So that is the message, like more or like an internal conversion. Maybe conversion, when it comes to conversion, it is metanoia. But metanoia, literally, it means change of path, something to do with our external journey, Alicia. Mm. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Alicia. Good. Yes, Good Sister Rose Yes, Sister Rose Therese. Sister, you are muted. Could you please unmute, sister? Your mic is mute. Yeah. Um, uh, you said Jesus suffered more than, Jeremiah suffered more than Jesus. I don't know. I cannot yes, think sister. of that. Uh, because uh, one is a savior, one is a human being. And uh, being a... Yeah. Uh, human human being suffering can be limited yeah. because without taking our sins of the whole world yeah. so you could uh, make a good sister very good sister this is nothing to compare who's suffering was greater but uh, my intention was like when it comes to the temporal length, Jeremiah suffered all along. Okay, even though Jesus suffered all along, but for Jesus as God, it would have been different. But Jeremiah was really a human person like us, so it's painful all the more. That was my point, sister. Good. Thank you, sister. Yes, we have Anthony Jesus. We have Anthony Jesus. Father, your presentation, your presentation is so good, Father. So good, and father. Uh, and uh, it's crystal clear. Crystal clear. I need to, I need to clarify to... with that. Uh, virgin conception. Virgin will conceive. Uh, conception. Is it uh, really uh, uh, prophet, a prophetic uh, statement for Mary? Or uh, later it uh, portrays or highlights the uh, to Mary. Okay. Good. Thank you, Jesus, for your question. So here, suppose we uh, this particular text about uh, Emmanuel, virgin shall conceive. This is from Isaiah. Isaiah primarily belongs to the Hebrew Bible. 
Hebrew Bible is the Bible of the Jews. So when you stop with that Hebrew Bible and you, you take it like a delimit it completely, it has nothing to do with any other. It's a, like a self-fulfilling. So in fact, it talks about somebody who is going to be born as a king immediately. That's the meaning within. That's the, so Hebrew, when you take the Isaiah text as part of Hebrew Bible, it has nothing to do with Jesus. But in a Christian reading, they call canonical criticism. In canonical criticism, especially uh, Pope Benedict XVI was a proponent of it. He tells every text is a Christological text, be it in the Psalm or in a prophetic literature or in wisdom literature. So he has every uh, Christian reading in everything. So for us Christians, it means that this text refers to the Messiah who is going to come. So otherwise, Isaiah might have never thought maybe in a stricter because in the context is entirely different. Zero, zero Ephraimite war has nothing to do with the messianic reading. And how Matthew uses the text, Matthew has always a uh, liking for prophecy fulfillment. So he will take a Old Testament prophecy and he will try to bring a New Testament fulfillment. And this is how he uses the literary device of prophecy fulfillment. So in that way, in a Christian reading, Catholic reading, so maybe in a Catholic reading, we say this particular young woman refers to Mary. But other than in a non-Christian reading or in a Jewish reading, this has nothing to do with Mary. This is how we understand Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much. Good, Jesus. Any other from newcomers? From SMM, SMSM, Seva Missionaries. And we have S5 D Silva. Uh, uh, yes, Father, thank you for your uh, enlightenment. Uh, Father, I just want to know if Jesus also was one of the major prophets, right? We could consider him to be one of the major prophets? Uh, no, in a real term, because Jesus, in Jesus' name, there is no book. Okay, Isaiah okay. is a major prophet because there is a major book in his name. But okay. in some cases, they say Jesus also was a prophet, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, in Luke, we have like people always explain that a great prophet has arisen among us, especially that Nain narrative. So Jesus, okay. Nain widow. So there, in fact, people tell Jesus, they attribute this particular title, prophet. And even in Luke 4, Jesus begins his mission ministry in Nazareth. He takes Isaiah text and he begins the, the spirit of the Lord is a fine me. So there he again is a prophet, a kind of prophet. He identifies with, with Isaiah. So from that point of view, you can say he was a prophet like Isaiah because he took the Isaiah text. But when we come from this particular literary point of view, Jesus never has a name in his own a book in his name. So that way he may not be a major prophet. Okay. Thank, thank you, Father. Thank you. Good. Any other for me from Sheva, Seva missionaries or JMJ? And we have Mr. Arulapan. If you have any question, you could ask. Any other for me? Good then. So this video will be available on our YouTube channel. Not only this video, all our previous videos are. So you go to YouTube, St. Paul's Bible College. If you type, you can get all our videos of the past lectures and even other things like we had Lenten Lectio, the close reading of the passion narratives, infancy narratives. We also have a retreat preaching for religious inter, inter, inner freedom retreat. So these uh, videos are available free. You could have access. And even we have Hebrew, Greek. We had Alicia, Mr. Terence, participants of those courses. Good. So today we have uh, quite a lot of participants. In fact, 52 users, but many have participated. So after a long time, we have got good audience. So thank you for joining us. Maybe we see that usually we have on Sundays, maybe when we anticipate to Saturday, maybe maybe we'll try to learn why this could. So thank you on behalf of our chairman, most of an Anthony Sami Peter Abirai. Thank you for your presence here. Now thank, you, Father thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Haven't come. <laughs> May I request Father thank Michael to say a prayer and give us blessing. <laughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our loving Father and Mother, we praise and thank you for this beautiful day, for the gift of Father Jesu, and for the beautiful lecture that he has given us today on the major prophets. Lord, we also thank you for calling us to be the real prophets of your kingdom. Give us your grace and pour your spirit upon us. Bless all of us that we may be sincere in exercising your ministry. Blessed Mother, intercede for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.